Thursday. Um, it's a total privilege to be here, and I feel um, quite humbled to be speaking from a position of extreme um, security and and uh, job security and you know um, physical security compared to some of the issues that we're talking about. It's quite emotionally affecting, I think, to hear um, both firsthand and sort of second and third hand stories. So, Sophia, thank you for organizing, and thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm Zoe Marks. I'm the director of the Global Development Academy, and I'm also the director of our African Studies Master's Program. I'm a political scientist by training based here in the Center of African Studies. And I'm going to um, speak briefly about, I've actually I brought my phone to just keep an eye on the time. <laughs> it's brief, is always relative. I'm going to speak briefly about some of the issues that um, colleagues of mine had faced in Uganda in the first instance, but also some of the issues that have arisen in my own collaborative research in Congo and um, some of the work that I've done with colleagues in South Africa around building sort of transnational solidarity in a regional context. Um, so I think one of the things that I was struck by listening to the earlier speakers is that it is really challenging to know what solidarity actually means in practice when the rubber hits the road. Um, I think it's striking how individuals are targeted by systems of oppression and by repressive apparatuses, and that can really fragment our attempts to build solidarity. It's much easier to think of solidarity when your solidarity exists in the context of collective action. Um, but the stories that came to mind when I was thinking about my comments are, are very much about how individuals have been sort of singled out and pulled out of the, the sort of flock, if you will, and how difficult it can be to kind of convene as, as colleagues, um, particularly in international perspective, but also sort of locally and within national contexts. Um, so I'll begin with the, the story of my friend and colleague, Stella Nyanzi, who was a research fellow at Makere University. Um, and she's, she's a very, very vocal feminist political activist in Uganda, in Kampala. And she was targeted for comments that she made on social media um, as a private citizen holding the first lady to account for promises that she'd made as part of a presidential campaign. So she was asking a political representative to provide the much promised and lauded sanitary napkins to keep girls in school. And her comments were seen <laughs> as being inappropriate and then um, she was under police surveillance, she was attacked, and ultimately she was arrested and imprisoned um, for a couple of months and she had also participated in a writing workshop that I organized last December with colleagues at the University of Cape Town in South Africa and um, one of the things that we were trying to figure out as this existing network of transnational feminist scholars who had mobilized because everyone was doing politically engaged work even though we had come together on that sort of pretext we still found ourselves with very few options to support Stella. She's a prominent human rights activist and a prominent sort of outspoken academic activist in Uganda. So she had legal counsel, um, but she was in the face of a very clearly personalistic political targeting. And there wasn't a lot that we could do besides communicating with our colleague who was on the ground with her, you know, organizing letters of solidarity, trying to keep tabs on the case. And at the end of the day, when somebody is in prison, I think it's really hard to figure out what solidarity looks like. And it's easy, I think, um, to occasionally slip into a sort of hubristic sense of an ability to change the situation um, because we have academic freedom. And, and I found myself quite frustrated and, and disappointed by my lack of options. And I think that was a sort of collective feeling that we all had. Um, one of my other collaborators at that workshop has had similar um, experiences of being sort of singled out, but hers have come not from the state, but rather because she's a, a queer, lesbian, feminist scholar who has decided to focus her activism at the local level. So instead of focusing on um, sort of political speech acts in digital spaces that were highly visible to the Ugandan government, like Stella, um, this colleague worked in local communities where some of her 
friends and sort of research associates were being targeted for being suspected lesbians, visible lesbians in townships in, in Cape Town, South Africa. And so her challenges, rather than imprisonment and persecution by the state, have been you know, how you can continue to do your work when the community that you research is being persecuted and you're being persecuted for your own identity as being of that community and sort of um, trying to give voice to those experiences. And I think what I saw in both cases was a, a total lack of support from the institutions that they're affiliated with academically. Um, and also a, a fragmentation of colleague support. And I think that this is something that happens in protracted contexts of academic persecution, where the persecution almost falls behind the scenes in many African countries. And it happened sometimes decades ago. But the knock-on effects of sort of lower grade self-censorship, um, selective hiring processes, denial of resources have created an environment where it's so resource deprived in some universities that the act of speaking out, of trying to generate political solidarity amongst colleagues who are doing activist research becomes quite threatening to academics' livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that has really stunted um, some of the opportunities to build solidarity um, in African higher education institutions. I want to pivot for a moment and talk about um, other realms of, of academic freedom and, and sort of citizenship in the global perspective through an African context. And, and I'm working currently with a research project that's multi-sited in Sierra Leone and in Eastern Congo. And one of the challenges that we've had with our research assistants and enumerators on the team in, in Eastern Congo, and this has affected a number of projects in Eastern Congo, is that as a conflict affected context, it's really difficult to provide recognition for academics' work. People often don't want their names to be attributed on um, research reports, on consultancy reports even. And that has knock-on effects for the types of research that we value, particularly in the UK. So the ways that um, sort of global challenge-oriented research and ref-oriented research is supposed to drive impact, it's supposed to have stakeholder engagement, you're supposed to have capacity building, all of these boxes that we think we ought to tick as a way of being good ethical partners and collaborators in research don't always work in repressive contexts where people documenting information, particularly about violence and conflict <coughs> and inequality, can get them harmed by political actors and economic actors in their local communities. So I'm interested in hearing more from people who are here tonight about the ways that both local and cross-national mobility can really constrain academic freedom. Mm -hmm. It can constrain opportunities for attributing research appropriately to the collaborators that we're working with, and that's not just within formal institutions, but also with regards to research assistance. And it can really limit, um, for my Congolese colleagues, it can really limit the degree to which they want to be engaged in, in sort of impact, in policy impact. To take the information to policymakers isn't really an option for them because that would suggest that they had to own the information, they had to say that the message was one that they were willing to risk their lives and their family security for. And, and honestly, they, they want to do research, but they want to do research because they like to do research and to get paid and feed their families, right? That's not, it's not a sort of existential cause for them. It's very much part of this broader research economy and an ecosystem of knowledge production mm -hmm. in which their agenda was, was never at the sort of the top of, of what the research questions were. Um, the last couple of things I wanted to say quickly, just to raise a few other kind of key issues in closing. I do think that self-censorship um, is really hard to assess, particularly with our colleagues in Africa. So it's hard to know how much isn't being said because people are choosing not to say it. It's that kind of counterfactual of, you can sort of see persecution when there's a rupture in the political space. But when it's sort of decades of of preferential hiring practices and resource erosion and kind of manipulation <laughs> of, of budgets and salaries, co-optation into political parties can silence academic debate, um, the sort of 
deliberate exclusion and silencing of individual voices can set an example for others, and we don't have a lot of good data or information about this. Um, there are some questions to be raised in African universities around student freedom of speech and the way that patronage politics come into the classroom so that, that people have to sort of perform particular opinions in order to get a passing grade, in order to do well, in order to get scholarship opportunities. Those are often very sort of politically managed in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And then I think most importantly, it can't be, none of these issues can be delinked from the way that poverty and the colonial history, which Sarah Jane will talk about a little bit more, have sort of systematically for the past um, 30 years in particular deprioritized African intellectual contributions. Mm -hmm. So the climate during the Cold War was very different and there was a real premium on intellectual exchange as part of the political project of consolidating power in the West or um, in the sort of Soviet realm. And that's, that's really changed since 1990. So in 1990, there was this Kampala Declaration by the Council for the Development <coughs> of Social Science Research in Africa, Codestria. And it does this amazing job of connecting intellectual freedom with social responsibility in a way that I think is um, a particularly African linking of, of responsibility and liberty, right? That there's a, there's a collective endeavor that's really clearly articulated in that. Um, but what we've also seen is that in response to that collective endeavor is a much more informal gatekeeping of Western dominated Eurocentric knowledge production about the continent. And so I've done quite a bit of research recently on the ways that that gatekeeping manifests that I'd be happy to talk about. But that's the soft version of academic freedom mm -hmm. where we see voices being excluded in, in not overtly repressive ways and not even by national governments but by the academy that we're sitting in today. Mm -hmm. So in closing, I would say that um, I think there's only ever as much space as exists locally. If local researchers can't claim their own ideas, then we're not actually providing the solidarity that we'd like to. Um, and I think it's essential to think about our responsibilities you know, as James framed the opening, we have responsibilities at the University of Edinburgh, but those responsibilities don't stop with creating opportunities here for people to find safe haven. They extend to the work that we do in the field and creating sort of zones of, of safety and security that actually open space and open the sort of protected opportunities mm -hmm. for speech and recognition of our academic colleagues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think Zoe has done a fantastic and comprehensive job of, of, of exploring these kind of issues. And I, I want to get us onto the questions, not least because I want you to ask Zoe about her recent research, which I think is really important and timely. Um, but I think, I think we can just kind of just drawing this out into the South African context, um, which is where I've done um, it, it, the, the country in which I've done a lot of research, although my research hasn't explicitly been on higher education. Um, I think we can see what kind of you were drawing out in the Codestria statement um, and in that kind of dawn of a, a new post-Cold uh, War era, we can see those various trajectories meeting in really important ways, and but also ways that are really tangibly shifting over time. And I think one of the really important things around this is a constant reassessment of the ways in which incremental and as well as larger structural battles are <coughs> shifting the terrains of academic freedoms in ways that we need to constantly assess what we're calling victory, what we're fighting for, uh, ways in which, and obviously um, in this context, that is integral into ways in which we're practicing and exploring uh, solidarity and building platforms and microphones that other people can use. Um, so I think, you know, if we're looking at the Cadastria statements and specifically around how it's really grounded in this idea that academic freedom is curtailed by structural uh, forces that are what they call historically produced and, and persistent, which I think is a really excellent way of kind of exploring this. We can look at how they're meeting currently in the South African context, and we can look at it at several fronts, and this is in no way exhaustive, because I'm going to try and cover it in 90 seconds so we can get onto, onto some questions. But I think we can look at the way in which we have these acts of uh, a state control and con creeping and different ways in which the state is trying to capture agendas to expand freedom and actually shut down space, both in the present and the future. And in the South African context, we've seen that 
in the 2013 oversight committee that put Professor Makoba in, in charge of kind of the exploring the transformation agenda and how this was going to be implemented, as well as the 2012 um, uh, amendment to the Higher Education Act, which gave Bladen Izamande, um, who's the education, higher education minister, um, new and important and vague and extended freedoms into um, the control of university spaces in ways that were putatively framed as being um, able to push forward transformation, but if anyone's been following Blade's statements around students and the student protests and fees must fall and roads must fall, you would be healthily skeptical and rightly uh, kind of wary about what exactly these, um, these powers are going to be utilised for. So of course the state is an important facet in this kind of picture, but I think as Zoe was really powerfully demonstrating, we would be incredibly lax if we were, were finishing there. The fees must fall protests that came out in South Africa uh, in 2015 were giving a really important kind of picture of the economic access issues that are surrounding uh, academic freedom. So if we're going to have an academy that is considered free, it needs to be openly accessible, meaningfully accessible, and people need to be able to stay on in that academy and progress and flourish. And obviously, economic barriers are incredibly an important part of, of that. Um, there has been, um, as has been showed by the, the reoccurring protests around that, there hasn't been a real um, substantive effort to tackle that at its root in South Africa. And in fact, when a lot of the protests were occurring uh, previously, there has been some legislation that was passing through that was worryingly extending the degree to which private institutions might be able to act in increasing terms in public academy spaces, which I think is, again, something we need to watch in the South African context as well as elsewhere in the future. And also the ways in which, in response to those fees was full protests and the roads was full protests, which we'll come on to in a second, there's been an extension of blending, blended um, learning in the uh, South African university space because essentially it enabled <laughs> students to carry on learning even if the university space was shut down by protests. And so I think there's a really important way there in which online learning spaces has fragmented the capacity of a, a powerful collective action space in the public space, physical space of the academy, uh, to have an overarching reach if students um, and uh, lectures continue, can continue as a, in a kind of a business as usual sense, uh, despite massive uh, collective action within the public space of the university because of online blended learning, then I think we need to think about the ways in which we're thinking politically around uh, these new learning spaces and what collective action might look like around and within them. But finally, I think it's a really uh, crucial uh, to address the ways in which uh, racism has been closing academic space, uh, academic freedom in South Africa, persistently, historically, and also kind of um, currently in ways that are being uh, challenged, but in ways that continue to be reinforced at an institutional level. So many of the kind of... Um, Coming through towards the end of apartheid, many of the ideas of defense of academic freedom were focused on so-called open universities that were able to kind of push back on the apartheid legislation that was regulating racialized space. Now, of course, uh, the uh, whole idea of what an open university uh, is and could be has been wholly challenged in uh, post-apartheid South Africa recently. We've got a constitution in South Africa that, has, that protects individual rights to academic freedom. But I think as the roads must fall process have really powerfully shown, the individualized liberal defense of academic freedom doesn't uh, means far more limited things when it comes up against the structural persistent oppression of uh, racism and other intersecting oppressions. And so I think um, a, a professor of sociology, Kulela Mangu, has said really importantly in this, um, uh, the debates and discussions around roads must fall, um, that, that in some ways this, um, the, the question of economic access <coughs> has sometimes been used in South Africa to distract from the persistent and ongoing questions of, um, of race and racism in the university. And I'll end with his words, no amount of talk about economic disadvantage will ever capture racism as a psychological and cultural assault on black people as individuals, students, and parts of the community in the academy. And his idea is that until 
um, uh, black students in South Africa are able to be welcomed into an academic space, to feel free within that space, to be able to meaningfully be heard and progress and flourish within that space, then any kind of talk of uh, liberally defended, individuated academic freedom is, um, is uh, not completely meaningless, then substantively challenged. Right, so we have some time for questions, and I did a terrible job as a um, moderator in not introducing <laughs> Esther and Cooper Nock, and then she forgot to introduce herself too. So, but, um, so questions for Zoe and Esther. Anyone? Thanks uh, for your insights um, from Africa. Um, I've not, I haven't been there much, but I once did go to um, Sudan and Ethiopia, and these are, I think, environments where you have these, these issues as well. But actually, I remember especially University of Khartoum as a place where, compared to the rest of society, there's quite a high level of, of freedom. And actually, it was there that we could have debates that we couldn't have anywhere else in the country, or at least in the city. So I'm curious if you want to just oppose what the kind of descriptions you just gave with, you know, the other flip side, if you like, or maybe the academy as, as a host uh, for, for formulation of, of free thought. Um, if no more, and, and maybe not, maybe, I mean, there's a while ago, maybe that has changed, you know, maybe it's gotten um, worse since, since um, yeah, we did mention earlier how, how it did get worse everywhere, including in this country. Mm. Do you want to start presenting? No, no, okay. Okay, well, I'm just going to, right off the bat, like I know almost nothing about the higher education discursive environment in Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, but on the, on the chance that I've misrepresented academic freedom in Africa, I think that there's, it's important to understand that um, universities across sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but also North Africa, have been really integral to political debates, mm -hmm. and they've been huge sites of political mobilization, party politics. Um, you know, in the, in the 1970s and 1980s, when there were coups and military interventions, the university was an important site of political purges, specifically because there's so much political discussion and debate and research that was happening. Um, so I, I don't think it's, it's surprising to hear that in Khartoum you found that there was actually a huge amount of sort of discursive space. Um, I guess the, the practices that, that I find most worrying and that my colleagues have talked to me about um, from Nigeria to Kenya, Uganda, is this idea that the way people are selected into positions now, the hiring practices, have, have become in many cases very politically biased. And I think that that has a tendency to to dilute um, academic discourse from behind the scenes. Is it a new thing, or was it always like that? In terms of the, the self-centering that's going on. No, the, the hiring the practices. Hiring practices. So that actually reminds me of like centuries of tradition in European universities. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, and, and institutions, yeah. Yeah. I think when you, when you have institutional diversity, it's mm. common for institutions to have sort of self-selection or one gets a political rep reputation. A number of African countries, because of the legacies of how their higher education landscapes have been constructed, have one really prominent university. Mm -hmm. Nigeria is a really prominent exception to this rule because they have several, Ghana has a few, so it's not that it's every country is the same, but I do think that there are fewer top universities in African countries, and so that means that if there's political monopolization of discursive space, then it, it just has a stultifying effect across the sort of potential of that academic milieu across the country. Do, is it new? Do you, I mean, do you want to jump in? Well, I just think, I just think it's, um, it, it's, there is a fundamental, I mean, of course, to some, sort of, some degree there is historical trajectories to all of this, but like, I think it's useful to go back to what Zoe was saying about you know, these bigger questions being essentially grounded in a very localized political space as well as a broader national political space. Yeah. So in, in that sense, if we're looking 
there's, there's, there's the temporal trajectories across the continent are so diverse, right, in terms of the, the shifts and the contestations around the opening and closing of democratic space in very particular ways. And then the ways in which that's localized around particular sites, you know, and, and we can talk more broadly are there about urban and rural kind of grounded universities. We could talk about um, how universities access in the university rankings kind of affects uh, the ability of voice and to be listened to. We could talk about the degrees and the disciplines that are particularly being sites of expansion and contraction. And I think once you start layering all of these things mm -hmm. on, you know, in, in a way, yeah, there's, there's been important historical trajectories. Is there one big picture? I, I don't think so. Um, but there's, yeah. but I think there's um, the the hiring practices. You think you need to look at, and in really important ways that the like the key vice chancellors have had really important impacts in certainly in the South African context. I think, in terms of the the resources um, allocation that goes behind hiring practices as well. So the potential where for for hiring at, at particular points. There, yeah, there's huge variation across the continent. I mean, there's, in the country that I've spent the most time working in, in Sierra Leone, which was once known as the Athens of West Africa, we don't have purges where professors are being disappeared in the middle of the night and their bodies are found months later. I mean, that that time has ended, but the, the sort of most preeminent scholar from Fort Bay College has written an op-ed a couple of years ago saying that, you know, the university is totally defunct and he's no longer going to work there because it's been rendered so politically inert mm. through the deprivation of resources. In Tanzania, a totally different approach has almost yeah. created the same effect because you've taken top academics and incorporated them into what's basically a populist regime under Magafuli. And so that's another way of, I think, silencing the potential for thought leadership to really transform politics rather than party politics to transform the university. I guess that's the mm. distinction I'm trying to draw. Mm. Thanks for the question. Um, I wonder if, the, if we, at this point, need to make a distinction between universities and people who learn at universities and people who teach at universities. Mm -hmm. Because often, and we can see this not just in this country, but all across Africa, but also uh, across Asia, th the university agenda is a very different agenda to the people who people it. And um, so, you know, in, in the South African case, the universities don't support, as an institution, they don't support the movements. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in Suchi's case, it was Suchi who um, went to teach uh, uh, gender and sexuality uh, classes in poor schools, poor colleges, in public universities. And then when she finds herself in trouble, the university is not supporting her. Mm -hmm. It's her who's in trouble, and it is her family who then have to, and herself, who have to bear mm -hmm. the brunt of that. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't want to talk about being in exile, but she finds herself in exile. And, you know, the university continues doing what the university does. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if, if we accept that, then what, so solidarity, how does that work then? Mm -hmm. um, is it, are we just, are we these atoms, these balls behind us, mm -hmm. who are kind of latching onto other balls? Um, you know, I think, we, do we still live in the days when, uh, universities shut down to support causes in other universities, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, something that factories did and other sorts mm -hmm. of workplaces. If those workplaces no longer do that sort of thing, then, you know, of course we don't do that sort of thing any longer mm -hmm. either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I think, it, again, it's really interesting to see where moments of solidarity are coalescing. So, so where, so, for example, the um, there's been there's there have been also individual staff who have been supporting the Fees Must Fall and the Roads Must Fall movements, and of course they have then come under attack in really important ways as well. Um, it's interesting in the Roads Must Fall case that then we had this kind of transnational effect of the Roads Must Fall protests that were happening across the globe. But I think that was almost stronger, I would say, as an echo effect than it was necessarily as a, a, a moment of, of solidarity that could 
really change the prospects of individuals within those particular universities who found themselves excluded or were unable to kind of continue um, their studies. I think that another kind of pernicious thing that occurs as well is the ways in which um, the attacks on individuals are reframed in technical terms, right? So that everyone knows someone's getting pushed out for a political reason, but there's kind of technocratic reasons that kind of come around that. And, um, and this is blended, I think, with um, a particular pernicious form of racism in South Africa where you've seen um, people like uh, William Makhoba when he came into WITS, but um, more recently, uh, Professor Pakeng, who've had their qualifications challenged. Right, so there's been this allegation that, and th this isn't necessarily because they've made a, a political manoeuvre, but this is, this is also a way in which exclusion is kind of reproducing themselves if people are being seen as kind of um, disruptive or framed as disruptive, even if they are not necessarily being so. This kind of idea, oh, well, you faked your CV, and this isn't actually a real qualification. And people being kind of dragged through that kind of uh, process as well. So I think it's I think solidarity is difficult when the processes of repression are actively attempting to individuate people, and we saw that in South Africa in the fracturing of the student movement as well, like active attempts to individuate the student movement and to fragment it. Um, and I think it's particularly challenging as well when uh, a political um, uh, action gets reframed in some form of faux technocratic kind of issue, which is which it clearly never actually is, but it becomes harder than to to support it. But that said, I think there have been some really important instances in which people have coalesced, in in whether that's within particular departments across uh, divides of employment or tenure, um, or transnationally, where there has been kind of that the stickiness that solidarity allows, which is, you know, not necessarily a permanence, but an important um, uh, move towards collectivity. All right, thank you, Zoe. And SJ, we could talk much more about all those themes, but we're going to move on to Turkey. Um, <laughs>